for thank you all very much. Yep. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. So yes. <laughs> Good evening all and welcome to the City of North Plain City Council regular session meeting Monday, May 6, 2024 um, at 7.01. Please stand for the Thank you. Mayor Linehan? Here. Councillor Page? Here. Councillor Hindle? Here. Councillor Haven? Here. Councillor Sheldon? Present. Councillor Smith? Here. And Councillor Martinez is excused this evening. Great. Thank you very much, Lori. Appreciate that. Um, our consent agenda, we have a few items on our consent agenda. Uh, the approval of the May 6th regular City Council agenda, the approval of April 15th City Council minutes, appropriation uh, May 5th through May 11th, Municipal Clerks Week, and the proclamation for May Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and are there any corrections to the minutes that we need to be aware of? So moved. Second. We have a person a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Any mm -hmm. opposed say nay. And then share it. Um, I want to bring um, the proclamation for the May Mental Health Awareness um, to the floor just for a few minutes to introduce a resident here in North Plains who has actually put together a group. I chatted with her a few times. I know she is this sort of place as well. Her name is Sarah Kelly, but I asked her to come this evening and just give um, a few minutes. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. But I really want to elevate you and your cause, and I'm hoping that you come up and just share that with us in a few minutes. Yeah, come on up to the to the table and just state your name and address for the record. Make sure you speak into the into the mics and folks on the Zoom call area. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Kelly and I live here in Plains on Cape Creek Court. And um, I'm on a mission to kind of normalize mental health. I have um, like a debilitating panic disorder, and about a year and a half ago, I did leave my house and I was kind of isolated and uh, I just go to the doctor because I thought I had every word of it. And yeah, I slowly got out of my shell and then um, step by step I started leaving my house. I walked to my mailbox. It took me about six months to go through McDonald's and start driving again. So then I eventually joined the Mrs. Oregon American Pageant System and that really helped me get out of my shell and then create a group here in North Plains. So Nobody could feel alone like I did. We always have support. And um, yeah, we meet every Monday. We're just kind of friends that are there for each other. And I just don't want anyone to feel alone in their mental health journey. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. And um, I'm happy to be here. And I'm happy to make some new friends. And I also just got my certificate in adult mental health peer support. Super stoked about that. I'm just waiting for the Oregon Health Authority to approve my background check so I'm registered with the state. I think that was so awesome. I think um, I just want to say how great you are um, for today, where you were, where you are today. And I think it's really important, um, you know, to acknowledge that for you. Um, can you, if folks want to know how to um, connect with you, um, how, what's the best way to do that? Sure. So I'm on Facebook, uh, Sarah Kelly. I'm not sure uh, 
like if it just have the Sarah Kelly and North Place or the Washington County Comfort Community Group. Um, Instagram, I'm not too sure how to send it on there very much, but um, I do have an account. I'm not sure how to just be Sarah Kelly. So, well, and I think it, I think it's the group that I, the Washington County Comfort Group. That's the one I was. Oh yes, really yes. Interested in. Yeah. Yes, Washington County Comfort Community is on Facebook, and um, we can also connect on there just through forums and talk to each other and stuff. I'm hoping to grow it more and more too. So, um, yeah, yeah. Any questions or comments for Sarah? Thanks. Sure. How many uh, people do you have already? How many people? Um, so How many people do you have coming to your door now or uh, by chance? Um, so, the work's got up for you? Yeah, so including me in the group, there's about 63 people. Really? Yeah, but I'm hoping to grow it um, more and more. I know that there's other resources out there, like I learned about um, Miami too, they do groups in the evenings and stuff. Um, I saw an anxiety one come open on Friday, so I'm like, is that going to go join the house? Do you find parking is a problem? <laughs> you're putting your house around, is that, is that where you're at? Is your house? Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. That's a great, great asset to have here, North Point. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you for, for being here and sharing your story. And I hope uh, folks are listening, or if they do listen to this, that um, and they need the, the support that they can job. Thank you for having me. Uh, everybody's welcome to join the comfort community. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. you. All right. Uh, next up, we have a uh, public comment. It looks like two folks have. Um, Lori, actually, before I call the folks in the room, is there anyone online or has anything submitted via um, email? No, not for it. Okay. okay, sounds great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Claire um, Basukas? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's a hard name. Basukas, so, okay. So if you would just make sure that you do speak in the mic and then uh, see your name and address. Thirty five eight zero five. You would call your bullet here. Three zero eight five eight Northwest Turtle Drive. Um, we recently moved. So I'm really nervous to be here too. Um, we recently moved to this area. Of, uh, my husband and I, and these are the table the Air Force veteran coping with PTSD. And it's okay. Take your time. Take your time. He's coping with PTSD and several related disabilities. About two years ago, on a therapist advised activity, we started going to animal therapy and noticed a lot of positive change. Since our move to North Plains, we're quite far from that location and have been considering getting emotional support animal ourselves. While the animal would mostly be indoors and at work with my partner, we felt that we still needed to ask permission as some of the regulations on ESA animals seemed unclear. When we started looking to obtain an ESA animal, we noticed that the animal in question, a miniature goat, was allowed in Washington County as a whole, but not within the city of North Plains, as they are considered a livestock animal and the city prohibits a certain livestock. Currently, the city does not seem to have a path in place to inquire about ESA animal implications, and we were wondering if that might change since there could be a way for a therapist to petition or perhaps seek a permit or obtain a specialty license. I think, um, I thank you for bringing things to our attention that we, um, um, chickens were the only thing that we have listed um, actually as an allowable uh, livestock animals only in the city limits. Um, and this is uh, really topics that are coming to my attention in the last 16 years. And I conferred with uh, the longest standing counselor um, and uh, he concurred that he has not this issue coming as well. So um, I think it's something that maybe we can take a look at, obviously just we're not navigating it. So I think um, if you would allow, I think Steve has your contact information, Steve. 
kind of your content information. And, um, you know, it's something that we can look at. Certainly can't promise anything, but I think it's fair just to at least see what the parameters might be, if anything. Um, and then I could certainly just ask them, you know, Steve, contact you and, and take it from there. So, well, that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Warren. I'm Glenn Warren, uh, 10845 Northwest, 311. I'd like to talk about two different things. One is the park itself. <coughs> At night, this part, just the main part. The park at night is supposed to be closed. Um, I call non-emergency because it's always, not all, sometimes violators are in there playing basketball or playing tennis because that light, but they still think that it's there because it's a tiny little thing um, when it's open, just get done. And the police will drive right up by, and they don't do anything. So that's one thing. The other thing is the pickleball. The pickleball is noisy. Uh, I know in Hillsborough they take, they redid a lot of their parks. I'm not asking to do anything like that. I'm asking the council to consider. But noise prevention now. That's little slats in between the the fence to maybe defer the noise from going outward, but might go upward, and it wouldn't bother the residents. And that's why I came to that. To ask you maybe the police the the park a little bit better if the police are here. And maybe for some of the noise. Um, is the noise at night or is it in the daytime? They're they're been they're late as two thirty at night. Um, and I'll call them on mercy. I shouldn't be the one that's always complaining about it. I think the police should do their job if they're on duty, but they drive around and they don't bother. They probably think that it, they don't bother anybody, but it does. You know, try to sleep, and it's uh, it's very annoying. It's like a parking dog, you know, basketball or the pickleball. So is it noisy at night? Can be an issue? Yeah, yeah, it's at night. Yeah. Sometimes the kids are just underneath the, the cover there. And that, by the way, that needs to be washed or something that's got black hold on. So the maintenance on. But yeah, there's all different types. It's actually the about seven or eight different people just continue to you know coming up. And I don't want to confront them living right across the street from the park. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Anyone else for public comment? We have someone on the air. Like, the raise their hand. Aaron, could you please state your name and address for the record? You're muted. Aaron, you're, you're muted. You're muted. You can't hear you. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Ariel, you're unmuted. We can't hear you. There's no audio. Your audio is not. Tristan, Councilor Pavin, can you say something, please? Just check out. Yeah, Ariel, I'm not sure if you can hear the City Council at Jesse Mays, but we can't hear your audio at all. 
I, we still can't hear it. I don't know, um, Mayor Linehan, maybe we can pause and give Ariel a moment to log out and log back in to provide public comment. Sure. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Awesome, just like a Verizon commercial. Okay, my name's Ariel Goodwin, and my address is 30845 Northwest Brooking Court. And I've got comments on several areas. First of all, um, unfortunately, the Zoom links to multiple recent meetings have been posted incorrectly, leading to individuals being unable to access, which is their right. Um, we need the city to do better and ensure this doesn't happen again, or really, honestly, it could be viewed as disenfranchisement. Um, I'm also calling out the conflict of interest that we have regarding the sign code, given that the planning commission um, includes Stewart, who has been placing the majority of the Yes for North Plains signs, and is, is an active sponsor of the Yes campaign. So would not be reasonably considered impartial, um, leading to unequal application of the sign code. Rubber stamping the proposed amendments by the Planning Commission did not integrate community feedback from um, the Planning Commission meeting where the community specifically requested clearly defined appropriate signage in residential properties, preventing future prejudice from the city removing signs they don't like. For example, you know, Terry's probably not a fan of the signs in my yard saying to vote no. Um, and we need the code to be revised so that it includes required warnings with substantial waiting periods, Removal by the city only was specifically re listed reasonable charges the Planning Commission had thrown out, you know, perhaps $5 as an amount. And the absolutely <clears throat> need to remove the use of property liens for unpaid fees. It's utterly inappropriate that there would ever be a situation where a resident of North Plains has a lien put on their house because the city didn't like their sign. I'm asking the city also to remain engaged with their consist constituents by not removing the comment ability on their social media posts. In addition, the process for posting the meetings with their agenda so late, basically the day of, and then expecting public comments to be submitted prior is not designed to encourage community participation. The agenda needs to be publicly available with a minimum of 48 hours for written response to be submitted. Most working families with kids can't attend these sessions um, based on the times, and reasonable access needs to be provided. Thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate your help and your service. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? All right. Moving on, um, AA is our presentation with the TTF, our Dwellers uh, Valley Fire and Rescue Group. Um, I don't know if you were all coming up or just one. <laughs> so they, we need more chairs. <laughs> now I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves, but I'll start off here. Hello, my name is Stephen Myers. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Stephen Myers. Uh, I'm the Public Affairs Manager for Walton Valley Fire and Rescue. It's my honor to provide you the State of the District uh, for the uh, Walton Valley Fire and Rescue. Before I get into that, I do want to uh, have Lieutenant Messenbrink uh, introduce himself. He's working at Station 17 tonight. Hello, everyone. Good show today. This is Kirk Messenbrink. I'm the Engineer Frank Love and Firefighter Hey, 
I also want to introduce uh, Corinne Hain, who's here, um, to join us uh, for this Great. district as well. Um, and then also, I understand you guys have a packed agenda, so I'm going to be uh, thoughtful of your time and try to move through, through things really quickly. Uh, but if you need to stop me and ask questions, please do so. Otherwise, um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so I'm going to do next slide. We have a video that includes our fire chief. He passes on um, his uh, appreciation for North Plains. He's at a conference right now uh, going in. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what our year has been, the major emergency operations we went into, uh, EMS in the area, our bond, and then a measure that we have um, for voters uh, on May 21st. So if you want to skip forward two slides, skip the videos, one more for that. So I don't know if anybody remembered, but we had a little bit of an ice and snowstorm hit our area. Um, and for us, what I just wanted to highlight quickly was the fact that this really tested our organization. Um, what you see before you is the blue line is the average number of calls that we see in our fire district uh, each day. Right there is Saturday when the snowflakes started falling, and you can see we tripled our call volume in one day. Um, and that meant we went into a mode called Mer uh, Major Emergency Operations Mode. We have not done this in my career or in any other's career, uh, and we basically we had more calls than we could uh, send resources to. Uh, so we stood up our fire operations center. We sent a liaison to dispatch. Um, we essentially, you know, made sure to triage the calls that we were getting um, for life safety and making sure that we could take care of people and then put the others into a queue that we worked to get to. Um, some of them were water problems, couldn't shut up water, but others were our major um, calls of which we have fires and cardiac arrest um, that we still need to get to. So as you can see, see over a five day period, we had 2,300 calls. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it really tested us as to all the things you train for coming to bear to see if you can actually uh, have the capacity to reach peak volume. Um, and for us, that certainly was a huge challenge. I'm really proud to say that we met that challenge and calls were responded to. We activated a lot of resources to um, respond to this. We also worked with utility providers to help have them go to some of those calls that they could help with and assist with, like water shutoffs, that we could then make sure our firefighters were available for major um, calls that were involved, involving life safety. Um, so, uh, next slide. Then I want to get into uh, North Plains here, and what you see is a snapshot of the city of North Plains. I do want to point out, um, as we're playing cards, the crew said, make sure we know like exactly <laughs> this is not just the amount of calls that they go on that you're seeing here. This is just within the city limits. The reality is they uh, respond to hundreds and hundreds more calls as they respond also to the rural area, right, where we have even more challenging uh, situations where they have to bring water on fires and, um, and respond over distances. But what you're seeing here is a snapshot of last year. Um, and within the city limits, there was 249 calls. You'll see a lot of those are EMS in nature. That's uh, the reality of our business. Um, but the difference here that you see at the top is dispatched as is what somebody calls 911 with. Situation found is what we actually in, um, encountered once we got there. The difference between those can be as simple as on a cold day, uh, somebody calls 911 saying, I see smoke coming out of the back of a home. Uh, we arrive and we find that a dryer vent is exhausting out the back. Um, so there's that goes into the good intent column. Um, as someone thought there's emergency and they were doing the right thing to notify us, but it wasn't necessarily a fire. Um, but data is important to us. This is what we use to cite resources and determine where we need to be to respond as quickly and as effectively as possible. And you can see there's a wide variety of calls that we respond to, not only EMS, fire, uh, but also hazardous materials, technical rescues, uh, and our water rescue team throughout the district. For North Plains here, uh, you get one red dot, which on the heat map there shows exactly where our calls are occurring and, and what frequency. Um, so we do respond quite a bit to the uh, apartment complex over there because there's lots of people living together. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty spread out over the area. 
Um, we also even track time of day. So at the bottom, you'll see exactly uh, each hour when we're seeing calls on average. Again, that helps us with staffing and with resource considerations. And then finally, you'll see kind of the trend over um, five years. The reality for us is over the last five years, we've seen a 17% increase in call volume. Uh, that continues to rise as we have a growing population, but also as our demographics change. As our demographics change and people age, that tends to um, generate more EMS calls. Um, so we're seeing that steady rise over time. The only blip you have is from 2020 when nobody really wanted this in their homes. Uh, they <laughs> might not understand why. <laughs> so that would be the anomaly. But you should be proud that here at Station 17, they're responding to most of your calls. And I do want to highlight again the amount of area that they cover in responding to um, fires and emergencies throughout this region. Well, next slide. Uh, you may have seen in the news some information about EMS. Uh, a lot of it's centered around Multnomah County, but we thought it'd be apt to make sure you knew what was happening in your county, in your area. And over the past year, we have seen improvements in the EMS system, which are really important to us, as for a while, we were seeing level zeros occurring in which no private ambulance was available for transport. Uh, that was a huge um, strain on our system. And what we did is we worked with county and private providers to say, we need to improve this system. It's not serving our patients effectively. Uh, that yielded a process in which the private provider was looked at. Um, we now have a new provider that's providing service for Washington County. And just in case you don't know, um, or for the public watching, uh, a private provider selected by the county to respond to the incident with us and then transport the individual from that location to a hospital or further care. Um, in this area, like I said, AMR is now serving within this area and we've seen an improvement in the response reliability of that um, group. We also though, need to be prepared and if our local option levy is successful in May, we're gonna be adding transport units to our system as we still do transport work in Yamhill County and we're the backup provider in Washington and Clackamas County when you need something. Um, I also want to bring one other thing to your attention with EMS, and that's the reality we face of high utilizers. Um, so we have individuals that um, in 2023, for instance, we had 99 patients who called 911 10 times or more uh, throughout the year. That generated 1,500 calls for us. That's a lot. Um, and it meant about 841 hours of care that we're providing to these individuals. A lot of times they need other services besides EMS, um, but they can't get access to them. So we're their primary care provider when they're in trouble. They need 911. Um, so we've been working to do a pilot program in which we send a single paramedic that's trained in resources that they can bring to bear to support that person because maybe they need housing, food, social services, mental health services, um, but they're not finding access to it. So we have people that are getting trained as community paramedics to go out and connect them with what they need, hopefully then keeping our heavy assets, our engines, and other uh, resources that we need available to our public. So they're still our patients. We want to do the right thing by them and take care of them, but that's a challenge we're facing and wanted to share with you some solutions we're trying to implement um, for that. Next slide. Uh, in 2021, we were uh, fortunate to have the public support a bond measure. Um, that bond we've been now working through with projects, and we have um, have, for instance, uh, Station 17 is on the list uh, for being renovated. Uh, but we also have some other projects that are really important for our fire district as a whole. Uh, next slide. One of them is at our training center. Uh, our training center hasn't really changed in, in a long time. Uh, and it, it looks the same for anybody that worked here in the 90s as it does today. Uh, and we need some updates there because we are training at least four academies right now each year. Um, that's firefighters and paramedic only. Uh, so we have a real uh, need there for uh, increased in infrastructure and um, resources for them. So we're looking at a thing called Recruit Village, is what we're calling it. And it's essentially a building in which our recruits can be housed, trained, have classrooms, and have indoor spaces that they could train at, which is really nice for when we have uh, heat, uh, when we have cold weather, uh, when we have a lot of even regulations around heat exposure now laws that we have to abide by. Now we can be more efficient and effective with our training um, if we're uh, as we build this structure. So that's one of the bond projects we're using um, to update our training center. Um, next slide. 
Final thing I wanted to leave you with, uh, you may be already aware, but we are on the ballot in May, May 21st, our current local option levy, uh, which expires in 2025 or June 2025, uh, is currently at 45 cents. Um, our board of directors has decided that based on our increased call volume and needs over the next decade, that that should be increased to 69 cents. So that's what we're putting before voters to consider. Um, so that is going to be uh, what they're seeing in May. And uh, for the average uh, resident, uh, assessed property is around $305 within our fire district. But again, assessed value versus what we see on solo is different. And, and the assessed at 305 means that the average taxpayer would pay about $210 per year is what that um, local option levy. And that's important to us with the levy because that pays for at least 92 firefighter positions at its current rate. And what we uh, project is with the additional revenue, we can have 36 more firefighters added. That helps us get to re re uh, calls more quickly and improves our response reliability. So it's uh, um, a critical need for our fire district and we appreciate voters considering it. Are you seeing uh, an increase in recruitment interest for that? Uh, for the to to be a to be a firefighter, yeah, uh, we have seen a dip. Uh, the reality is, we used to have hundreds and hundreds of applicants every cycle. That number has gone down drastically. There's a bunch of different um, factors in that, specifically in paramedics. Um, their paramedic schools were shut down during COVID, so there's a lag of um, paramedics to come into the system, and our numbers are still um, low. Uh, we'd like to see them get hot, higher. We're trying to get the word out on um, what an amazing career it is to consider being a firefighter. Most of the responses are around are the, the EMS phase. You can join the, uh, the EMS phase. Correct. Staffing. We have one or two EMS people, and staffing as far as. We have on duty. Is everybody EMS trained? And then people specialize in fire? Is EMS the basis and then fire is different so than the higher level? Or does that work? Yeah, so every firefighter is trained to a basic level of EMT at least. Um, and then on each engine, we have at least one paramedic. Um, so that means they can provide advanced life safety care. So every unit within 12th Valley can respond as an ALS unit. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have paramedic only. So those are, they're not trained in firefighting, but they are specifically paramedics trained for EMS response. And they can be on our medics uh, that respond to the transport units. Uh, and then further, we have single role, or we have a, a single unit responses like the one I was talking about with our pilot. So we try to be dynamic in how we respond. So each call doesn't need uh, a full engine response. Um, but the reality is we need to be cross-trained to respond to a variety of challenges. Is the hiring pipeline only really somebody that applies at a college into the academy and does your job? Or do they go to the uh, private ambulance route, Metro or somebody, AMR, and then they get their, they get their chops in and they may apply for the job? How does it really work? How does the pipeline fit? Yeah, I think the answer to your question is there's such a variety of ways to come in to the fire service, and we're seeing that. Some people choosing it as a second career. I mean, somebody that was recently in our academy came through a marketing uh, is what he was doing originally and realized he wanted to go a different path. And then we have some that come right out of high school, straight over to Chemeketa or to one of our community colleges to get their uh, EMT. Um, and then they start working uh, to do internships and volunteering. So there's a lot of pathways. Um, and then we also, with that paramedic only, have tried to create a new pathway where maybe you're not a firefighter, but you're a great paramedic. And you can come into TDFNR and figure out if maybe eventually you want to be trained by us to be a firefighter or you could just stay as a paramedic. So we're trying to cast a wide net. Um, to attract those that may be interested in the career, but the tenants still apply, um, that you have to be customer focused and taking care of our community, um, excellent the job you do, and expect a, a high level of service to be provided no matter what the call is. And what about the care? It has to be a big, big thing. Is that something that's you're getting away from? Sure. 
Yeah, nationwide there's a shortage and the numbers on volunteering keep going down. Um, and so it's been a challenge for all departments, especially those that are around us that do re re rely heavily on volunteering. Um, we still have volunteers and there's three different ways in which they can uh, work with us. Um, so we have those that do response and right now they're even being um, trained up to help us more in the wildland areas as we're seeing more wildfires and, and brush fires in the area. Uh, they can also be incident support volunteers in which they respond and take blood pressures, change air bottles that firefighters wear, and provide rehabilitation for those that are working hard on the scene. Mm -hmm. And then we have those that don't want to respond and get up in the middle of the night. So we have an auxiliary category where they help go to community events, educate the public, and take care of some of our antique fire apparatus. We've had, we've had here quite a few years. Is that something that you can add again? I don't want to sell. I think uh, I'll ask for uh, the city council and ask questions. And oh, see what's going on. yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we try to do luncheons once in a while, inviting our city to come in and, and join us for uh, lunch and see tour around. But we also do open houses. We found that the Garlic Festival is pretty popular here. Mm -hmm. um, so we now align our open house with that date so we can get the maximum amount of people coming through. Because we want to see, um, we want to have taxpayers come see um, what their dollars are paying for and come meet the people who serve them. So do you advertise that? Is it, I have, I do a lot of work at the volunteer at the Garlic Festival, but I've never known that we've had a Lincoln House there, which means if I don't, I we, we try, but we can always do better. So I'll, I'll kind of do it for and she can help uh, in us spread the word because we try to make sure they in North Plains knows that they can come on down and get a hat and get some uh, uh, fire safety education. At that event too, and then right before that is uh, National Night Out. Oh yeah. So maybe that's something you can look at. National Night Out. That's not famous for the house. Yeah, as long as we're not involved, we're trying to educate and show them out. Yes. And the other things that we serve, we try to each one of those to make sure that we're educating law enforcement partners. But if there's more ways you can help uh, us promote what we're doing at the fire station, we greatly appreciate it. Bring it in. It's June 6th is our uh, ice cream social, which is chill on each day. Where do you think you're going to this place? Maybe you open up in it. I think you guys don't want an ice cream, right? You just, uh, <laughs> just heard some time. Is there going to be ice cream here? <laughs> Um, this one is on um, a Zoom call, which I can't have heard, Councilor Paven. So, before I Councilor Paven, were you done with your presentation? Yeah. I know we. So, this is trying to seem perfect. Um, Councilor Paven, do you have any questions? You know, I just had one quick question. Can you tell me where Station 68 is based out of? Uh, station 68 is our North Bethany uh, station. Um, it's where one of our trucks is housed. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Anyone else? Comments, questions? I had a question about the um, renovation. Um, you mentioned that Station 17 is um, going to be renovated, or where? where are you? Just curious. Yeah, we have a number of stations that are on our list from the bond to be updated and, and need updating. Um, and Station 17 is on that. I'm not quite sure what the timeline is right now, but I know it's on the list as we're working through. Um, right now, our priorities are a couple stations that we need to completely um, get rid of and rebuild. Um, Station 35, for instance, in King City is the top of our list uh, as we've been trying to actually update that for a while. Uh, but we have a number of stations that include 17 that will be eventually uh, renovated using those bond funds. I got my feet wet and it's a great opportunity to get sort of thing. It's that some need that to it is, yeah. Our fire chief uh, supports that so much that he wants to start trying to do it twice a year now because it's a great opportunity for our community leaders to get involved and 
come put on some turnouts and drive an engine and do all the things that the mayor participated in. Uh, so that invitation is open if anybody's interested. Just let myself or or not. Any other comments or questions? Well, we we appreciate it. Sharing this really important information and you know, your pop in and give us an update on Thank you for your time. Yeah, you better. Right, we have two resolutions this evening. Um, the first one is resolution number 260 on the one just triggered by GA. Dustin. Good Mayor, Council, and for everybody on law, and behind me, and Dustin will be on the public works director for the city of North Plains. So if it's hard to believe, I've been here and here all right. This is my first resolution that I've to Civic Council. So wish me luck on this. Good luck. It should, it should be pretty easy because it's a formalization of an informal agreement that we already have in place with TEWD. Um, and so hopefully um, you all re read a little bit of the um, uh, resolution, the staff report. And I'll just kind of um, briefly mention what's going on. Um, we've been out without a official in-house DRC that's a direct responsible charge for our water system um, since before I was here with our passing, not passing, but the, uh, um, the retirement of the previous public works director. And so uh, TBWD has been informally filling in that role uh, since that, and they've done some other things to help out the city. As you know, we're fairly uh, small but mighty staff. Um, and so that is um, also, uh, I learned today that our small and mighty staff got even smaller because TEWD poached <laughs> one of my guys. Um, so that's just a seasonal help. So this is all the more reason to have a resolution like this be passed because we do need a lot of help um, uh, from time to time. Um, so one of the things that uh, TVWD also does um, is help us with our SCADA system and they help us with emergency events around the city when we need it, um, when we need the extra manpower. And so um, with this resolution, it just formalizes what we already have an agreement with them. Um, and if there's any questions, um, I am open at the moment. Um, Councilor Sh um, Bage and Councilor Shelton. So for the $200,000 a year, uh, helping the state system just the computer program, what kind of help are they giving that you can't do in house? Maybe they're not licensed for it, or maybe they're not certified? Is that what it is? It wasn't need to be certified. Well, the twenty-five thousand dollars isn't just for the states. That's for all the help that we received from uh, from TBWD. This past year um, was actually a little bit more. Like we're only looking at at spending maybe about twenty-five thousand dollars a year on a contract basic and consult type basis with them. And we spent a little bit extra money on the SCADA system this year because of. Um, some of the issues that we've got at pump station one and getting our emergency generator back in place. And just, we, and no, we do not have the experience and the, uh, the basic personnel to be able to do that in house. And we had to either get TBWD or get someone with Portland Engineering uh, to do that. And TBWD has a very good networking place to be able to do those things for us. Um, as far as, um, this year um, is, is out of the norm um, because there's some things that were also set up that hadn't been set up previously, and I don't expect that to be a continuing basis. And even then, if we do go over that twenty-five thousand threshold, that's an agreement that I have that we have with TBWD to kind of you know you know make sure that we're uh, not going over that without first agreeing to what those terms are. So I see a big list of billable hours uh, for the trucks and software. How much does we actually use? Is that increasing our retainer? And for the last year, yes, we went 
greenhouse, but a lot of that was actual uh, cost that or one-time costs that should have been done previously, but um, we had to catch up with that. Um, now that those costs are done, the estimate is to be about twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Can we go a message from there? Is that this is flat rate that it's faster insurance policy at the end? They we have that many issues it's more of an estimate and um, especially as we are shortening through we need to get other uh, crew members from time to time it's just there as a um it's it's not like a minimum it's more of a, like a guide are we using it for like basic everyday process work we run that or do you have anything else we use it only for emergencies they're, they are doing DRC services, which is mostly more of a formality, kind of signing everything out. Between the end of the year, we do, but they make sure that we are doing the right things um, on the administrative level, but on the actual maintenance level, they're helping with our flushing, um, our flushing system, um, our valve um, inspection system, basically anything dealing with the water distribution system. Um, between inspection to actual physical hands on maintenance, they were out here uh, during the, I mean, we kind of mentioned the snowstorm earlier, and we came for um, the major leak. Um, and our, like, our SCADA system actually caught that, that one of the leaks, and we were out there looking for it. The SCADA system doesn't do um, pinpoint exactly where it is, it just says, Hey, we have an issue going on, now we got to look for it. And so, we had TDWD also out with our crew. Um, helping find where that one um, uh, break was. And so they, they come and assist us in those kind of things. And if our backer truck is down, they'll come out and they'll help us uh, with those services as well. Uh, there's a lot of services that they can do and they have helped us with in the past year. Yeah, and I see that with but they can do everything under the sun. I'm just wondering how much of it are we reliant on them versus in-house? Our, our typical process base, that are getting operations. How much are you relying on outside? That's my question. If we're looking at a percentage of us doing it in house and TDWD helping us, I, I would say we're doing a good maybe 75 to 80 percent in house. There's not a lot that TDW, TDWD is, 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 is doing um, other than assisting our normal operations. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dustin. And uh, I get it. I've been through it, and and the uh, resolution looks good to me. Only one point that I was a little confused about. When I think about it, I'm thinking about time and time, right? So we're getting there. Um, but one of the one of the sentences, I think, it was in the second paragraph. I think I was a little confused because I know Javier recently passed. Did he recently pass? So, okay, so it says next one to two years. I'm thinking, what's the timeline to have him in the DRC and then you're going to be following up? It, it just was a little confusing as one to two years, who's one, or we get one and then two years from now, two. What's the timeline? Is that going to happen? Four months from now or six months from now? The one to two years is more of an estimate. Hopefully we can be able to transfer, since Javier already has his distributor too, he's eligible to become our DRC. Um, hopefully within the next six to 12 months at the earliest, um, we can be able to do that transfer. But we also have a number of things that are going on in the city, especially our water system survey, our five-year water system survey that um, TPWD is going to actually help us. Um, we have a lot of policies and procedures that we need to update, an emergency response plan that we need to update. And to be able to do that, we're all going to be on the same page. And um, with that, it's, it's probably going to take us about six months to a year to really figure out what we need to do and have a DRC uh, get into the nitty gritty with. And with, within the next year or two, um, it's possible we might have two DRCs with uh, myself included as I get time to be able to pass that exam as well or that certification as well. All right, that's just a that clear which is a little. Cloud here. No questions. Thank you. 
Yes. Is there a recommendation? Um, by council? Well, I move for approval of resolution number 2261 to approve the intergovernmental agreement with Tomahawk Valley Water District uh, for operational support services. Do I have a second? Oh, All right, I have a first and a second um, discussion. I do want to just say, communication in section two, it says TBDS. So, just want to make sure that that gets corrected. Uh, second, we're uh, at section two on the actual description. Okay. Are you first and second? Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Mm -hmm. Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion carried. Thank you, Justin. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next up we have resolution. Um, I'm sorry, uh, we have resolution 2262, the interim city manager management agreement. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You know, the water system will be taken care of. That's really important to me. <laughs> really. Um, well, as everyone knows by now, um, we'll be leading the city's employment towards the end of this month. And um, in that time period, while searching for a new city manager, um, Rob Drake has agreed to serve as interim city manager for a period of about six months. I know um, most everyone in the city council knows Rob. Um, so we've known him for, for quite a long time. Rob has a history on um, Washington County. He was not only um, uh, mayor of Beaverton for several terms and the city councilor in Cornelius for over 10 years. He also served interim stints in Tillamook and Carlton, so he knows small towns and he knows about the issues um, that North Plains is dealing with. He's led the WCCLS Library Levy uh, Committee for a number of periods, so he's definitely um, familiar with the library system. The library will be going through a levy renewal period in 2025, so um, Rob will, will help step into some of my shoes for um, some of that work and I'll work alongside Robin. Um, Rob spent some time in the office for several hours this month, so everyone on the staff has really got the chance to know him. I think we'll, um, folks will look forward to working with him. Um, again, this agreement would be for six months, temporary. His first charge would be to, to work with a recruiter or a permanent replacement of a, of a city manager. And we're hoping to have a recruitment um, a proposal to the council at the next meeting on May 20th. So Rob will be here for that. This first day would be May 20th for a period of six months, no more than six months, uh, to the end of November 20th. If a city manager is found before then and his services are, are deemed no longer uh, needed, he's agreed to um, to shorten that whatever 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 the city council needs at that time period. So uh, the uh, agreement is attached as Exhibit A to the resolution two two six two. If you have any questions about it or about Rob, I'll just let you know. Councilor Pavin, I'll start with you. If you don't mind. Yeah, you know, I was pleasantly surprised to see Rob on the um, agenda, and I've worked with him in the past, and I am in full support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Andy? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move uh, adopt, uh, to adopt resolution number 2262 to uh, Approve an agreement with Mr. Rob Drake uh, for services as the interim city manager for up to six months. That's very good. All right, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Uh, Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, she carry. Thank you. Uh, 10 a ordinance number 494. This is the city file TA 24 25 sign code text from the name of it. Um, Steve, 
Yes, thank you, Mayor, city yeah. councilors, uh, Steve Bueller, planning manager for the city. Uh, we're working on getting a PowerPoint up here real quick, and uh, I'll walk you through that. You, you've seen it before, but there are a couple extra slides uh, to share with you, so um, I'll do that. And then I might, since there are some folks in the audience here that were not at the planning commission meeting, I, I might just walk through the whole amendment so everybody can get familiar with that. Uh, with the next slide. Um, so this slide here is showing you really what we've covered with the um, sign code text amendment. And as you can see, we've essentially touched every section except for one. Um, and that's the very, it's not 416, there's another section below 416 that we did not um, do anything to. So it was a very extensive uh, sign code amendment. And we did touch many of the sections there within the sign code. Uh, next slide. Um, we touched on this with your work session, but some of the new things that came into the sign code and the definition sections had to do with um, air blown signs, um, your, your banner type potential flags. Uh, we did not have anything in the code on that before. Uh, we also updated many of the definitions. And, and like I said, since we have some new folks here, I'll walk through that here in a minute. Uh, next slide. Um, as you can see, we already have some of these type of signs in the city. Um, they're, they're in a lot of different locations, but these are some folks, uh, some locations that people are probably familiar with. Um, so it's nice that we are trying, starting to address these because they are becoming um, more prolific in, in town. Uh, next slide. Another thing that we added to the sign code is a section for exempt signs. And these uh, signs are um, twofold. Uh, one of the exempt uh, type of signs that we have is for um, the type of signage that you generally see at like a, um, at a high school baseball field or something like that, where you have your sponsors up uh, on the outfield, um, signs and windows, um, other things like that that um, really don't really require a sign permit. Um, the other ones that we've exempted um, have to do with um, basically your government signs, your directional signs, your speed limit signs, your wayfinding signs, things of the nature that you put in a right of way to help people navigate through your city and understand where hazards are or um, other type of things that you need to be aware of as you're driving. So we've exempted those signs um, from requiring a sign permit now. Uh, next slide. Uh, something we did add to the commercial zone that was not there before is rooftop signs. So the planning commission uh, determined that uh, there could be a need for some rooftop signs in the C2 zone as the city grows and, and some people may be off the beaten path a little bit. So there might be a need to have a sign on top of the roof to get folks attention. So the planning commission decided to bring rooftop signs into the C2 zone. That was a big change there for the C2 zone. Uh, next slide. The big change that we have for the M1 and M2 signs was to bring back pole signs. So pole signs were not allowed under the old code. With this proposed amendment um, in the M1 and M2 zone, you would now be allowed to have a pole sign. And the Planning Commission's rationale for that was when you go along West Union, there are lots that are off West Union. They sit back quite a distance from West Union, and it's hard for them to um, be seen. So the planning commission thought it would be a good idea to allow those companies to have a pull sign so people could uh, get a better idea of where they're located. Um, so they have proposed to allow that now in the M1 and M2 zones. Uh, next slide. Um, as a result of the recommendation that came from the planning commission, they did have a couple um, changes that they proposed. Uh, the first change had to do with the, the temporary um, um, political signs. And so in the top section there where it's highlighted in blue, that was the original proposed language. Um, and then below that is the language that the Planning Commission recommended at their last meeting. And so it basically says the same thing, but in a more condensed way. Um, so they added um, the underline, they took out the, the, the public and then added cycle. And they took out everything else that was in their original recommendation. Um, so that's that's what you have before you tonight. That's the proposal for temporary signs. The one in the in the bottom there is how it's written up today. Um, next slide. Um, there was also a, a typo in the M2. It said MT-2 and not M2. So we updated that. So now it just it says M2 the way it should. Um, there is also um, a little bit of concern about um, when we're doing. Um, enforcement or, or trying to remove an abandoned sign, who was the correct um, person to send a collection to? And 
uh, Commissioner Levante believed that the assessor's office wasn't the correct location. So I reached out to the assessor's office. They said this is something they can do actually through a special assessment. Um, but it is very complicated and it is um, costly. We, we have to pay for the special assessment to have it put onto the property and maintain that special assessment as an annual fee for that. Um, and so if you, if you go to the next slide, in those conversations, what we determined it would be better to just do it the way we do it when we put a lien on someone's property. For example, when we have a, um, a property that's overgrown or something that we might have to go in and mow, um, we would put a lien onto that property if they don't reimburse us for the work that we did to, to mow that lawn. We're going to address abandoned signs in the same fashion. Uh, we'll recommend them to the, uh, to the city recorder uh, for lien assessment against the property that the sign is located on. So uh, those are the three changes that came from uh, the Planning Commission um, meeting last month. And uh, if you go to the next slide, um, the conclusion here is... Um, is for the city council to hold uh, the first reading tonight of these proposed amendments on ordinance 494. Um, and tonight you could um, recommend approval of that as part of your um, ordinance, or you could approve with some conditions to add to the proposal, or you could um, deny the text amendment. Um, this is a very necessary text amendment, I believe in staff's view, uh, because the code was a little dated. So we certainly do recommend that the council approves um, the first reading of ordinance 494. Uh, next slide. And with that, I can take some questions. And if you would like, uh, Mayor, I can also walk through the whole breadth of the signed code text amendment just for the folks in the audience, if you would like uh, to do that. Do you know the cost of moving the sign? I mean, it varies. Is there like a minimum charge or is it like a whenever? I mean, it depends what the sign is, right? So that's going to back home and like that. But Are you, you trying to get the, uh, how do you know the cost? For like an abandoned sign? Right. It would be just uh, the cost would come through. We would probably have to hire a contractor depending on the type of a sign. I mean, it could be a sign where we need some type of a crane to get up there to remove it. So it would just be the bill that we receive from the company to remove the sign. But again, you know, it's all case by case. It's sign dependent, right? So that's kind of the worst case scenario. It's a sign that we couldn't remove physically ourselves. We need some help to get it done. Um, if it's a sign that we could remove, we would just do it probably on an hourly basis based on the public work staff's time that it took to remove that sign and quantify that on an hourly basis. <laughs> To the uh, property to to pay, and then if they did not pay, we would lien that amount against the property. Would you repeat your question, please? I'd like to explain. Um, I, I'm happy to walk through the whole breadth of the sign code amendments that we have proposed because there are some folks that weren't here at the planning commission meeting, so I showed you kind of the the highlights. Uh -huh. um, but if you'd like, I'm happy to walk through the whole thing. We, we have it up here, and I can do that pretty quickly. Um, sure. Okay. If you don't want to bring it up, just give us one sec. Since we had to switch computers and stuff, I had to email the stuff to, uh, to Bill, so Bill <laughs> has to grab it for me. No, no. Oh, yeah, it is. I'll think about that. Oh, you want to try to reach them, the because that will be found on the most important thing all the time. Yeah, they don't want to open it. No. Okay. We're saying that it should be part of the agenda. So that's what I'm getting to. I think it's up high. If I go to Zoom, that should be one that's about your color and thing on Look on the agenda. Do we know where where's the agenda now? Because it's pretty everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah, the last one. Okay. Okay. Thanks everybody for your patience. We're going to probably blow this up a little bit too, so it's uh, easier to see. Making our Google screen when we uh, jump to it. There. Um, uh, okay. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, so um, I'll just walk everybody through this real quick so you can kind of see where we made changes to the sign code. I'm sorry it's a little hard for everybody to see that, but. Um, um, I'll, I'll try and do my best to explain everything to you. Um, so what we did um, with the abandoned signs is we didn't have much of a definition there before. So we essentially um, brought in a whole new definition for what uh, constitutes an abandoned sign. Um, <clears throat> and we indicated basically how that's going to look in terms of, you know, once it's been out of use for a certain amount of time, we will reach out to the folks to let them know that we would like it removed. And then if nothing happens within a certain amount of time, then we would take action ourselves to have um, the sign removed. Uh, we added a definition for the air blowing signs, as I mentioned. So now we have that. We also added imagery to the definition section to help folks better understand what we're talking about. Um, if you want to scroll down, um, we brought in the attention flags. Um, uh, again, something that we're seeing more and more of, but did not have it addressed in the sign code. I'm going to scroll down a little more. Um, so we, we added the changeable um, signs, uh, which is just kind of out of the picture there. But um, we also deleted column signs because the problem with the column signs is it mirrored the pole sign definition. They were essentially the same thing the way it was defined in our code. So uh, we took care of the duplication and decided to um, delete the column signs. Um, and then there was some Scribner um, things that the planning commission wanted updated. They didn't like, like for example, in electric message signs that uh, that second uh, one there was all capitalized. They thought that that was unnecessary. So anywhere in the sign code, we had those all caps uh, kind of buried into the middle of the definition. We changed that to just standard uh, font. Um, so you'll see some changes like that in the definition section. Um, we also added some language to clarify what the frontage of a property is, so people understood how we look at the frontage. Um, and then, you know, we took uh, an added planning manager to that one definition because now we have a planning manager. We did not have a planning manager before, so it was the city manager that was going to make that call. So we took the city manager out and added planning manager. Um, and the monument signs, we added some, some pictures to help people better understand what a monument sign is. Uh, it just seemed as we were working on these text amendments, um, you know, one of the things jurisdictions do a lot of is we look at what our other coworkers are doing in other jurisdictions, you know, and how they address some of these situations. And one of the things that we saw is the better sign codes had imagery um, to help people understand what, what we mean when we're talking about these type of signs. And so we thought that was a really good um, thing to do. And so we started to do it ourselves, brought images in for some of these definitions. Uh, we updated the mural language a little bit. Um, there were some redundancies in there and uh, just kind of calling everything a mural. So we added some additional language to help people understand where we don't want those things. Um, and then on the pull signs, let's go down a little bit. Um, we updated that whole definition basically because we got rid of um, the column signs and added some imagery there too to help explain what would be a, uh, a pull sign. Uh, so you can see it can be an individual pull, it can be two poles, or essentially a column. Um, but all of those now are considered a pole sign under our definition. <clears throat> we did a little bit more cleanup of some language there. Um, 
And then for projection science, we added some imagery, again, to help people understand. Uh, one of the tough things with uh, putting imagery into the code is uh, we want to be neutral. We don't want to promote one business over another. So it's very challenging to find imagery out there that can share a sign that doesn't pr doesn't promote a business. So we, we got pizza and we got um, the big. We, we thought that that was pretty neutral. Um, and then the hotel signs, um, we also updated the definition there and added some uh, imagery as well. Uh, the sign area, we added some language. Um, and then um, we also added some uh, information on how we measure signs. Uh, and we probably tried to provide some clarity on that. Uh, we get a lot of questions on that actually and how we measure area of signs. Uh, sign companies are very good at knowing how to do this, but every jurisdiction does it a little bit differently. So it's good to have a little clarification in there for those folks. Uh, go ahead and just going down. Uh, that's all the same there. Uh, we just cleaned up the temporary signs again, just a little bit of um, font changes there. And the unlawful signs, we added some, uh, some language to that. And then the wall signs, we brought in some imagery. Uh, wayfinding signs, we basically updated um, the, the whole definition. And then window signs, we updated the whole definition for that as well. Um, so that's really the extent of the definitions that we updated. Um, like I mentioned in the other presentation, we added this section to the code, the exempt signs. And as I indicated, these are largely for your governmental signs and right of ways. And for you know those type of things you see at a, uh, a school field, um, maybe in a window, um, like I said, scoreboards, um, those type of things we're going to exempt from requiring a sign permit. Um, they seem to be in the uh, community's best interest to have um, those uh, sponsors uh, sponsor these um, programs. So we don't want to hinder their ability to put a sign up and show their support for the local uh, groups here that, that participate in sports or whatnot. Um, and so when we did this section, when we added this section, every section below that had to be updated. That's why you see a little number change on each one, uh, because we added that section, everything below that now had to get uh, bumped up one number. Um, so that all changed as it rolls through the code. Um, in terms of residential permitted signs, we didn't change anything. We just took the column signs out since we deleted that definition. Um, signs in commercial zones. Um, the big change there was really for, um, excuse me, for the monument sign, we uh, increased, um, go down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sure. So thank you there. In the, in the C2 zone, um, and I'll just help this for everybody uh, in the audience here. Um, we have two commercial zones. We have the C1 zone and the C2 zone. Uh, the C1 zone is only located on Commercial Street in the downtown core. Uh, and the C2 zone is only located along Glencoe between the highway and Commercial Street. There is a little bit more like where Garbarino is, that is the C2 zone. So there's a little couple spots where we also have the C2, but primarily it's along Glencoe. Um, and what we did for that one is we, um, we updated the uh, monument signs. So we went from 32 square feet to 40 square feet, and we put a maximum height on a monument sign of being eight feet. And then we also brought in roof signs uh, to the C2 zone. So those are the big changes for the commercial zone. Um, if you want to go down. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we took roof signs out of being uh, a sign that you can't have in the C2 zone because now we put that in. <laughs> Science in the neighborhood community zone, we did not change anything uh, other than just uh, the numbering that needed to be updated. Uh, institutional zone was the same, uh, just the numbering. Uh, science in the industrial zone, that was another area where we added quite a few uh, changes. Um, we updated, um, again, the, the wall sign requirements. One of the things we were seeing for some of the larger buildings along uh, West Union was um, our sign code was a little out of touch with the size of the buildings that were being built over there. So you could only, you could build a large building in the industrial zone, but you could only get a 32 square foot sign to go on the building. So it was really proportionally just out of whack there a little bit. And so we looked at some other jurisdictions and we found that um, 150 square feet um, was pretty much the standard for these larger industrial buildings. Uh, so we have it to not exceed 150 square feet um, or 10% of the wall area. So whatever one is, is that number. It can be 10% um, or up to 150, but not more than 150. And then we also um, brought in roof signs to the industrial zone. Um, just a second here. 
And then we also brought in pole signs to um, just the M2 zone. So the M1 zone, it did not uh, get that um, update, just the M2. Uh, again, and that's primarily everything along uh, West Union is where that M2 zone is. The M1 zone is primarily off of commercial, uh, kind of behind it where you have um, Global Electric and uh, some of those uh, businesses back off of commercial. Um, Next, uh, we're going to look at more. Um, these are the temporary signs. I shared that with you um, in the slides earlier. There was a minor change that the uh, Planning Commission recommended, but I think it still achieves the underlying objective of what the previous language um, had. Uh, so it's still, still capturing the intent of what they did the first time. I think it's just a little cleaner now, not quite as wordy. Um, scroll down a little bit. Um, really, the next major change comes at um, the um, enforcement arm here, the abandoned signs. And uh, you've all seen this before, but again, the big change, um, and it's not reflected in this, but it is reflected in your clean version that you have as part of your ordinance, where it's not the county assessor we're sending it to. We're going to go the route of the city recorder um, to record a lien on the property. So I, I apologize that it's not updated in this document here, but it is updated in your clean version that's a part of your uh, ordinance document tonight. Um, and that's that's really all I have um, for the sign code amendments. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, man. Thank you for any questions. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, just for clarity, um, so folks want to <laughs> understand that C and M and P. C stands for. Would you please uh, just define what the C and, and C1 and C2 stand yeah, for yeah. and the M and the M1 stand for? Just okay. Yes, yes. Um, so generally, um, fit in there, does it? Uh, I think you're we have two commercial zones. Um, the C1 zone is really a downtown type of a commercial zone. Um, the C2 is more of a general commercial zone. It's a little broader, allows for more uses than the C1 would. Um, so for example, in the C2, you could, um, you could get like a, an auto business there. You could get, um, um, gosh, I can't even remember all the uses off the top of my head. Daycare, you can get um, drive-throughs, drive um, all your kind of stuff that you're used to seeing along uh, Glencoe right now would be the type of uses that would be allowed there. Really a big difference between C2 and C1 is the city manager was whispering in my ear here is you cannot do drive-throughs in the C1 zone. Um, you know, in the C1 zone, we kind of anticipate seeing more uh, zero lot line type development, you know, in a downtown type setting, you know, where the buildings kind of back up to one another so you don't have that opportunity for a drive-through type of situation. So um, that's really a big difference. Uh, and then, you know, the C1 zone also incorporates all the um, design review standards that the city recently adopted as part of the downtown improvement plan. So there are more design standards in the C1 zone for the building facades and, and their appearance than you would find in the general commercial zone. So um, that's the main difference between our commercial zones, um, the M1 and the M2. Um, the M1 zone is a light industrial zone, uh, so you won't see your really intense industrial uses in the M1 zone. And the M2 is more of a general or heavy industrial zone. And uh, as I indicated, you primarily see the M2 in, along West Union, on the north side of West Union, as well as um, in downtown um, where um, Oregon Canadian is located. They're all C2 or M2 as well. And then as you push behind to the south of um, Oregon Canadian, you get into a couple pockets of the, the M1, which is where um, um, <coughs> Global Electric is located and the food processing plant over there, they're all in the um, M1. So does, does that help answer your question? Yeah, and then the IP, IPU zone is the institutional zone and then the NC zone. We use yeah. those acronyms. We know what they are, right? and sure. I just to be clear that folks in the audience and that understand what those acting, you know, um, those mean. So IPU is the institution zone, and then the NC is the absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, that's the a, that's a, just clarity on what those those how those were. Sure, sure. That's a great point. Obviously, we get used to our acronyms and they just roll up our tongue and we forget that everybody else doesn't live in our planning world, right? It's useful clarification of what we're talking about here. Uh, the, um, 
the institutional zone is kind of what you would imagine. It's really for um, civic and, and um, religious type purposes is where you would see that zone well, the most. So we have it. Um, our churches are, are all zoned institutional. Um, the city properties are zoned institutional. Um, and that's really the only places you'll see that. And, and the fire station as well. Um, and, and the, um, and the um, line, I mean, the, um, the um, post office is also has that zoning. So it's very limited. Uh, it's in the places that you would expect to see it. Um, and then the NC zone is um, a red, it's, it's kind of a master planning zone. It's a residential zone in Central Neighborhood Community. Um, there's only two places in the city where this uh, zone is applied, and it has to do with the new subdivisions that have come into the city at Sunset Ridge and at Bring Home. Uh, those are the only properties in the city that have that zoning designation. And it's really because when those properties came online through a UGB expansion process, they were required to master plan those properties. Um, there were large properties where we wanted to have a good idea of how the whole site was going to be developed. And that NC zoning gave us the ability to require that master plan so we could look at the whole property in its entirety versus uh, just a little bit at a time. Um, and so that's really what that zone is. And it's a broad zone. It covers a lot of different things. But um, again, we only have two locations. Cool. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Um, Councilor Pippen, I want to make sure that you know your, your questions are answered. No, thank you. <laughs> there are no questions. Um, what's the say in the council? I appreciate what supporting part of the commission. And those who are the same. Uh, first, um, to page second, by Councillor Smith. Any discussion? I didn't see a typographical error. I think it was 5479. I can't imagine it makes any difference. If it gets corrected and what we're accepting, it, you can't think of it. It's going to require an act of the council. It's under mural. It's in. Uh, I think it's in the first paragraph. First sentence, uh, the term uh, relates to, should relate to ball and spill plate. That I've been through that thing. It's pretty clean. I remember going to prior revision of the code, and I think it's also very clean. And uh, so I don't have any objections. That'd be finally for the discussion. And there's also, uh, it was brought to my attention, there's also a uh, an error in the actual ordinance. It's got a date of June second, twenty twenty four, for um, public comment at a meeting, which mm -hmm. obviously we haven't gotten there yet. So I took a note down to look at that corrected before the second. And thank you. Yeah, no second. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve. Yes. Under mural. That is what it is section. I, I just saw that, but yes, thank you. Uh, signs and commercial zones is number J. Uh, oh, uh, I. One monument sign. No, 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 no. Anyway, it's about a mural to sign. So when you do these paintings downtown, like on Oregon Canadian, are those considered murals or paintings? Murals. Mural, so that fits in that description Correct. of any size, which is great. Yes, we, we do not have a size limit on a mural. Okay, good. Um, it's interesting. Our code talks about having a, a mural committee, um, which yeah. we don't at the moment. Uh, and so the decisions, well, to staff at that point. Um, and I understand that that's how the first murals uh, went up on those um, buildings around um, commercial in Maine. Yeah. Um, and then when um, Oregon Canadian decided that they wanted to do some murals, um, they came in and shared their uh, scope of work that they wanted to do on those buildings there. So uh, we approved them kind of in a phase because they had a, they started in summer and got the one done that you see right now, but they also want to continue to the west and do another addition to that. And right. so we approved, approved them for the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any more discussion? So again, we have a first by Councilor Page, second by Councilor Smith. No further discussion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Carrying that, motion carry. 
So, um, ordinance number 490 is an ordinance of the city council, the city of North Plains, Oregon, yeah. implementing an amendment to text of the zoning. Thank you. 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 Yes, you need to approve the first reading. First reading. Thank you. Well, thank I'll move you. Thank you. the first reading of uh, ordinance number four. Thank you. Night. Second. Second. Discussion. Thank you, man. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And you say nay. Very none. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. All right. City Manager. Madam Mayor, I don't have a lot to add um, at this hour of the evening. I'm um, uh, of what's already included in the report. Just a quick note, unless in case it doesn't come up later. Um, we have day. Is this Saturday? It's just like last year. It's going to be a warm one. Uh, yeah, St. Edward's Church, and um, they've been great for her. As well as the county. Um, I, I want to move real quickly to a memo that's included at my report, and then at the end of that, so have, have to answer any questions. Um, I had to pull up my iPad, which died, but this is a great opportunity because the memo itself was written by Bill, who's working on it, and it's an agreement we have with a, uh, a property owner in town as they're closing this property. It's a, it's a financing agreement of uh, TDTs, first of its kind for the city. It's something we have the ability to do, it's something that other jurisdictions do. It's really just an administrative decision, but we wanted to let the council know what bank crops financing is, in particular this piece of property, because it's it's pretty much going to be the largest transportation development tax um, payment probably the city's received. In history, not not an aggregate. These subdivisions will do more, but one piece of property for sure the biggest. So um, that presented some questions for the property owner, and um, Bill did a good job of looking through the attorney. So Bill, if you want to take a couple minutes and just explain um, this agreement and how we came across the terms and uh, the, the repayment schedule, all that. Sure, thank you, Andy. Um, you didn't know, no, correct. Um, the 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 development of the ten acres on the south um, ten acres of um, what we all kind of collectively call the Far West property, right on West Union Road. Um, that that project is right on the verge of building permit. Um, but the transportation development tax that we collect, it's a county uh, tax um, at the at building permit time. Typically, not always, but typically. Um, we collect it at the same time as SDCs um, and other fees, but in this case, the TDT is going to be about $1.1 million, and it will indeed be the single biggest one, uh, single biggest TDT that's levied on one single property. Um, but under Washington County Ordinance, the county has chosen that in the case of the TDT, because it's really their tax to be collected and do projects, the county approved project, county list of projects with it. Um, but the county has chosen to allow development interests to basically negotiate an installment payment plan if the fee is big enough. If it's non-residential and it's big enough, um, the development interest can, can have an installment, negotiate an installment plan. Um, so we have a draft agreement in place that will be finalized prior to building multi-city certi certification by the county. Um, that would be the, the condition of the final stage of this. There has to be a finalized agreement. But as is um, the the development of that property, the, the company that actually will close on buying the property after the building permit is issued, um, they will take seven years to pay that to us, um, pay that back, um, pay that off, right? um, and at an interest rate of 5.3% annually, um, the city will, will take in about $230,000 the amortization schedule, about $230,000 in interest, in addition to the $1.1 million TDT being paid, about $95,000, payments twice a year for seven years. Um, and so the city will be taking on quite a bit of money, additional interest, um, and we're structuring it um, so that 
the agreement you know, basically rides with the property. Um, this is a bit of a complicated development project with somebody buying the land, um, building the pro project, a different company leasing uh, the building, and then a user inside that is not the company that's leasing the building. But we're having it structured. We work with um, with BEH. Um, we work with the city attorney. We'll be sure that we have documents in case that assure uh, guaranteed guaranteed payments. So um, it's the first of its kind, and just, we just kind of want to run through that. Work. Yeah, how does that 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 figure out for cost? Okay. What, what where did that cost come from? Great question. So basically, it ultimately comes from the size of the building. This building is going to be just over 200,000 square feet. Um, now, it's all going to be industrial use. It's going to hold a bunch of machinery and it. it's going to be a little more warehousing oriented, but it's not going to do, have a bunch of traffic. These are big machines that are going to be inside, um, is our understanding. But the building itself, the size of it, just over 200,000 square feet, that's the basis for the transportation development tax. Different uses generate different types of traffic, traffic counts. Um, and this type of industrial use in the county's use land use schedule, um, we take that rate and we apply it to the size of the building, the number of square feet. And that's what generates that $1.1 million. And budget wise, where does this fit in? The money, this fee, and the interest on it will go into the city's transportation development tax fund, and it will be used for transportation projects and new transportation projects in the city. Councilor David, do you have any questions? Okay. Any other questions for Bill? So this is the county tax and we're collecting it for them? Correct. Um, the, the transportation development tax is a countywide transfer, transportation system tax, but each city within the county collects it and uses it for projects, um, projects to qualify within, the, within that city. So, each city implements the county adopted tax. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Sheldon, and then Councillor Kendall. Bye. Uh, quick question. I've been through the agreement. Well, I haven't been through the agreement. I've been through what you presented. Uh, my only question was I didn't see anything in relation to whether this is paid in advance or under papers, which will be part of the, the agreement. I know. I'm just kind of curious. Mm -hmm. We have not finalized the agreement. We have some kind of assurance of credit. The questions I have to work out with the developer, but I can, I can let you know what finalization of that is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Bill. So the, the county's on the hook for this if they don't, if something falls through. Okay. It's within fall down with the city. Um, Councilor Kendall, actually, um, the way it will work is we will have a lien on the property. Okay. Um, the county is not on the hook. Okay. Um, the property will be. Okay. And, I mean, and also, the, I thought the PDP was for transportation issues. Was it not? Yes, sir, it is. So there's not a lot of, I'm just amazed that the, there's not a lot of transportation in and out, but there's what it costs just to do the business. For that, you know, for that main dollar. Just in that building alone, it just amazes me. You know, the cost. The, the, the county, the, the county charge, we don't charge on anything at all. Do we? The, the, trans, the transportation system development charge that yeah. is a city SDC yeah. on this building is about $110,000. Is it? And okay. they have paid it. it. Okay. It is paid in full. Oh. And yeah, they, so the status of the project is um, we worked very quick. They 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 need they want to get building permit as quickly as possible because of the process of the county has taken a while. Yes. Um, and so they have paid out of the city fees that we were voted prior to building permit. So all of our SDCs that apply, and then water meter drop fee, everything has all been paid except for the transportation development tax. But because it's an installment payment agreement. Um, they will not get a certificate of occupancy for the building at inspection, final inspection, unless this agreement has been finalized, inked, 
and um, transfers legally over to the owner who is yeah. well. All right, sounds good. Tell me good yeah. up. Thank you for bringing that to council. Appreciate that. Right. Um, council reports. Uh, I know it's still actually pretty early in the year. Um, I think I have planning commission on Wednesday. Um, council page your parking right and then council and council Michelle. Um, actually, I'm sorry, you did it. Yeah, I obviously attended the meeting and there's some good progress there under for efforts in making the plan. So I think the plans come along and I have some of the self plans. And so I think they've got a good framework. They've got a few things that they still need to iron out. But other than that, which they're planning to do, you know, Talking about business community and you know, they need to they need to make sure they're engaging Congress and they do have players in those plans as well. So it was um, well attended. Uh, it was it was good meeting. It was productive, and uh, I'm not sure it was next, but they'll get to get in a little more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. 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 Thank Family Justice and I need to go to the center. Ask them to get a table. And ask the council to get a great lesson. So I just treated the individual um, tickets. So I already bought mine. But uh, the one thing. I guess. Sorry. It is like 18. Yeah. It's so that's too much. Yeah. Because it's really good. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't have anybody. Councilor Smith, you do? I've got a few. I attended the River Cutting for Valley Central Valley Sports Bar. But that went pretty well. Did two Zoom meetings with the CCI. You were part of one of them. It's kind of interesting. I think they've gotten kind of away from what they started out to be. To me, it seemed more like a political action committee than a CPO. Um, kind of disappointing. Um, kind of the city of banks, state of the city. I have to talk to the mayor a little bit. Um, did show our picture of our unveiling our sign. Yeah. The mayor was also there. One thing I want to bring back up again is when they are showing parts of the city, they show the water tower and an emblem on it. So, <laughs> somebody's going to make me push me up a bit to bring that up again. I see that going here in the next couple of minutes. Do something, come up with a new design. And I guess there was more with the city meeting there. Seems like they want to a different group wants to come in this room. The city of banks also. It's kind of it's kind of sad. Well, the for city storage is that would be able to contribute. So I think that I that's the city contributing. You know, it would have been today. You know what? I have been off the hook for my ex officio duties, so I don't have anything to report. Thank you. All right. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to move into a second session.
and I'm going to turn this over to both so she script. Um, this is a time when unfortunately the public is a participant in this conversation. The city council will now meet in the executive session under ORS 2.6062, parentheses H, to consult with council concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body regarding current litigation, litigation likely to be filed. News media representatives and staff designated by city council are committed to attend the executive session. News media representatives, staff, and council members are respectfully directed not to report on any of the discussions that occurred during the session, except to state the general subject. Session if there is a need for action on the executive session item. No final action decision may be taken during the executive session. Any materials distributed will be collected by the city recorder at the end. Thank you, Lord. All right, we are back in regular session at 9.10. Any other comments, questions? Karen, that will go ahead and adjourn our regular session. Thank you. Good night, Council Peak. Thank you.